Welcome to everyone. I'm Ruth ben uh, a professor of Italian studies and history here at New York University. I'm um, doing double duty. I'm introducing uh, our, our panel. I'm also one of the um, editors with Stephanie Malia Holm of this book that we are here to speak about, um, which appeared from Rutledge uh, and on Italian mobilities. So um, I'm going to read right now the um, bios of, the, of our participants. And then they'll, um, our two uh, commentators will speak briefly, and then we'll both speak, and then we'll open it up for questions. So a very informal event. So my co-editor, uh, Stephanie Malia Holm, is currently, um, she's won many, many prestigious grants. And at the moment, she has an American Council of Learned Societies Fellowship. She's a Rice Camp Fellow, and she's a visiting scholar at Stanford University while she's on leave from her position as Presidential Professor of Italian at the University of Oklahoma. And she's trained um, from Berkeley uh, in literary criticism and cultural anthropology, and her scholarship uh, explores the narrative, symbols, spaces, and differences that give rise to Italy and the greater Mediterranean as political imagina imaginaries on a globalized scale. So she has received an American Academy in Rome Prize, an ACLS, the Stanford Humanities Center, and many others. And she's the author of a book that came out this year, a fabulous book called The Beautiful Country, Tourism and the Impossible State of Destination Italy. And she is now, uh, and I urge you all to buy it, it's uh, published by Toronto uh, this year. And she's currently working on her second book, which I'm really waiting uh, to read, called The Empire Between Mobility, Colonialism, and Space in Italy and Libya. So um, she is actually the, of the two of us, she is the mobility expert of, um, on this project that we're celebrating tonight. We also have Simona Wright, who's professor of Italian and director of the Italian program at the College of New Jersey. She holds a laurea in German language and literature from the University of Kaufoskari and a PhD in Italian from Rutgers. Her areas of research are 20th century Italian literature, post-colonial studies, Italian cinema, uh, Giacomo Leopardi, and contemporary Italian poetry. And she's published extensively in all of these areas, editing, for example, in 2014 with Fulvio Orsito, Contaminazioni Culturali, and she's presently editing uh, volumes on Leopardi, one called Crossing Borders, Reimagining Contemporary Italy in Cinema, Literature, and the Arts, and Africa and the Italian Imaginary. So she's very well placed to comment on Italy as, as a space in, in and of the Mediterranean. And then we have Amara Lacus, uh, who's born in Algeria in 19. 70, he moved to Italy in 1995. He has a degree in philosophy from the University of Algiers and another in cultural anthropology from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. And he completed there a PhD dissertation entitled Living Islam as a Minority. So he's the author of five well-known novels, three of which were written in both Arabic and Italian. His best known works are the much acclaimed Clash of Civilizations over an elevator in Piazza Vittorio, which my class is going to read this in a few weeks, Divorce Islamic Style from 2012, and from 2014, a dispute over a very Italian piglet. And his novels have been translated from Italian into many languages. Um, he has been awarded the Flaiano Prize in Italy in 2006 and the Algerian Booksellers Prize um, and Clash of Civilizations was chosen for the 2014 New Student Reading Project at Cornell. And we're very, very happy that he's teaching here in our department a course called Narrating <coughs> Immigrant Experience. And he'll be teaching at the University of Connecticut um, next semester, which is our loss and Connecticut's gain. So he lives in New York. And I'm glad to welcome all of uh, you to our panel tonight. OK. 
Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful introduction and thank you for inviting us to discuss your uh, very interesting uh, um, volume. And, and thank you all of you to be here tonight. Um, I certainly must say that I have struggled with mobilities coming from Princeton <laughs> today. <laughs> it, was, it was a challenge. Um, but um, um, it's interesting, um, I'm very I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to read uh, uh, Italian Mobilities because it seems to me that this is a perfect moment for our research to focus on not on migration but on the concept of mobility. And I think that uh, the authors and editors in this volume have done um, a phenomenal job of uh, framing uh, the question of uh, Italian mobilities or even Italy's mobilities at this point because uh, um, I think that this is one of the questions that I'm going to ask uh, uh, and regards the notion of Italian uh, when we um, address Italian mobilities, what is Italian in the mobility. Um, but the interesting um, wide angle lens and the framework of, uh, uh, of the study um, includes uh, many, many different aspects of uh, uh, Italian history in which uh, mobility is embedded from the very beginning of uh, the post-unification era. Mm -hmm. So uh, many of the, um, of the uh, chapters, and I'm going to focus uh, briefly on uh, four of them, the first four, um, deal with the question in many different, uh, um, in many different ways. Uh, first of all, uh, the question of mobility uh, and this uh, I'm calling into, into the, uh, the, the frame, um, Stephanie Holmes' uh, uh, chapter, is also uh, hiding the darker side of immobility. So when we speak of uh, uh, our um, neoliberal, uh, transnational uh, world in which uh, economies uh, are um, uh, moved uh, by this turbo capitalism, we, uh, we realize that uh, mobility is uh, uh, a dimension that is uh, acceleration, it, it, that contains acceleration, that contains movement, that contains progress. And we are, most of us uh, in the global north, uh, are uh, actors of this mobility. But there is the darker side and, uh, and that side is a side that uh, um, <coughs> Stephanie analyzes very well uh, in examining uh, Ponte Galleria. And in Ponte Galleria, immobility becomes material, becomes uh, um, a, a moment of suspension in which uh, bodies and human beings are kept uh, in a sort of conditio inumana uh, that uh, Agamben defined very well. Uh, already the terminology utilized for uh, the, um, to define these centers, centri di uh, te uh, permanenza temporanea, so centers of per uh, temporary permanence, uh, is oxymoric. Mm -hmm. So in these centers, time is suspended and uh, um, the system creates um, a network of time and space that um, are practically circular. There is no movement in this particular, in this particular center. There is no movement, no possibility of mobility, upward, downward. It is a limbo in which many of the people that hope to uh, or hope to uh, move up find themselves um, because of particularly uh, rigid migration laws and uh, securitized system uh, created by larger complexes, larger, uh, larger national, supranational assemblages uh, that uh, force uh, the, those that desire mobility to actually 
uh, be halted. Do you, Simone, this, sorry to interrupt you. Do you want to explain, in case people are not familiar with Ponte Galeria, what yes. the, the larger context for what yeah. it is? And this is the subject of several of the essays, especially Stephanie's. Exactly. Ponte Galeria is uh, a CIE, Center for uh, uh, Identification and Expulsion, and it's actually the last uh, station before uh, the unwanted are actually uh, excluded from uh, the, the, the larger uh, context of mobility. So uh, generally, uh, the illegal, illegal uh, migrants arrive to Ponte Galleria and then are, uh, after months of uh, suspended life, uh, are actually uh, taken away, taken away from the country. So, like the interesting aspect of Ponte Galleria is that when they enter Ponte Galleria, there is a sort of a chaotic system. It's a system that includes chaos. There is no logic. And that resembles very much the univers concentrationnaire of which Levy was talking about. Because in this particular space, uh, uh, the body, the, the being, the subject, uh, enters a space of invisibility. So in this space is uh, uh, an exclusion. And it is the materialization of the exclusionary practices put in uh, force by uh, European laws, national and supranational. So when we talk about uh, a system where mobility uh, is, uh, or, or goods, uh, te uh, technology, uh, ideas move freely, we have to think instead that there are many more um, systems, invisible borders, that uh, the global north has put in place, invisible to us, but very visible and material to the people that experience them. The other uh, interesting uh, chapter that I would like to mention, uh, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to take too much time, uh, but uh, it's the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a chapter that discusses mobility and marginality. And it is Pamela Ballinger's uh, um, chapter. Mobility as, um, uh, within the framework of mobilities, there are marginal mobilities, there are differential mobilities, and this is actually something that came very, that was very evident, very manifest in all the, the, uh, the chapters, all the authors mentioned. So there is a certain marginality of certain mobilities. Italy has been, since uh, the uh, 1860s, uh, a place of emigration and a place of colonialism. And in many, um, in many, um, let's say, uh, there are elements or moments of our history that have been completely neglected, that have been completely marginalized. For example, when emigration and uh, colonialism collide, and our uh, and Italians are uh, forced to emigrate. Uh, to, to different uh, countries in North and South America, but mostly in North America, and at the same time colonize, so migrate to the colonies that Italy had, uh, that Italy had dominated, that Italy had uh, uh, included in its territory. So these, the stories of these uh, mobilities have been neglected, because in general they also implicate uh, a self-reflection, a historical, uh, examination of the responsibilities Italy had uh, in respect to the, the colonization, so the violence that went on in those, uh, in those areas, but also in respect to the people that lived there and were actually forced to come back to Italy after the colonial period was over. So a uh, most interesting uh, chapter was dedicated to this uh, particular uh, people, to this particular histories. So you see now, you, you start seeing how mobilities were, are used in this, in this uh, volume to actually point the light in, uh, in, a, in a spatial and temporal dimension that is much more textured that uh, in uh, general studies of migration. So the lens, the wide angle lens, goes in depth 
goes uh, spatially, you know, very uh, uh, beyond the confines of Italy, and talks about all these neglected aspects or forgotten aspects of history. So this is a, a very interesting uh, um, part. Um, Another, another question that is, ra uh, that is raised in the volume is the question of Italy and Italianness, Italy and Italian identity. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, point made by um, Harney, Nicholas Harney, in his chapter. Uh, Italy is both a concept, it's a, it's a construct that is exported, of course. Now that we have uh, 60 million Italians living, or you know, descendants of Italians living uh, in uh, uh, all over the world, and um, Nicholas Harney uh, focuses more on the uh, Canadian Italian communities of Toronto, and complicates his examination by actually bringing into the the, the exploration the differential mobilities in Naples. So the Bengali co community and the Italians who are living in a new economy and are feeling the crunch of uh, this, uh, the neoliberal uh, doctrine. Marketization, privatization, uh, deregulation have completely upset the fabric of a nation that was built on a social democratic uh, uh, structure. Um, so now uh, Harvey complicates the stories of uh, uh, the Italian Canadians living in, in, in Canada, but trying to recuperate, to recover whatever is of an identity, whatever is there of, uh, of uh, a sense of community, of belonging, which is, of course, in our times, fragmented, uh, very uh, effervescent, uh, very uh, particularized. And then, uh, opposes it, the stories of Italians and migrants in Naples, you know, in a condition that is very uh, mobile, and uh, yet another mobility that is uh, uh, complex, textured. And the last thing, the last point I want to make is the question of representation. As in Ponte Galleria, the idea, the notion of a temporary permanence or permanent temporariness is uh, subsumed under the linguistic framework of host and hospitality, which is another point that is very important, and I think that Stephanie really uh, captured the, the, the idea. Uh, we have to focus on the language, because language is homogenizing. Language tends to eliminate all the variables, all the, um, the specificities. So this is a very important part of the uh, the rhetoric of migration, which is uh, ongoing in Italy and has become the uh, the victim of, uh, of of a language and a discourse that frames migration in terms of invasion, in terms of contagion, in terms of contamination, and therefore uh, homogenizes the. Uh, the, the, the story, the stories of, of other uh, other nations, under the, the category of uh, uh, fear, emergency, crisis. So this is uh, one of the most important, I think, uh, uh, points made by mobilities is that we have to look at this phenomenon by studying all these different aspects and how um, notions and constructs become. Uh, uh, in prison, um, orientalize uh, the, the the idea and, and the people that are actually subjected to to this phenomenon. So the last uh, thing that I would say is uh, uh, a very important, uh, in my opinion, a very important chapter is the chapter by uh, uh, Rianne Noel Welch, who uh, discusses uh, Amelio Lame Amelio's America, and uh, in that particular uh, mobility, we see the immobility of representation, how Amelio cannot go beyond the representation of himself. Uh, uh, so there is what I call a riflesso, but not a riflessione. Mm -hmm. So there is a riflesso of, uh, in fact, he mentions, of course, many times uh, the fact that uh, the Albanians look like their, their relatives, etc. But then in the end, uh, this reflection, uh, this re riflesso, is not uh, 
that does not produce a reflection on the history of Albania and the uh, imbrications of Al Italian history with Albania. So um, from my point of view, this is a, a very, very useful, very opportune uh, volume, and uh, we can discuss more about it later. Thank you so much. I thought before um, before going on, I um, we don't we don't have the book here uh, to be purchased because of the uh, in part the state of book publishing today. It, it is very 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 expensive, so we don't have it out. But I, I thought perhaps just um, tell you some of the chapters. Um, so the, we have an introduction. There's the um, an essay by Pamela Ballinger, who is an anthropologist, um, and you'll see the different um, disciplinary contexts of our contributors, <coughs> called Beyond the Italy's, Italy as a Mobile Subject. Then Nicholas Harney, whose essay Simona mentioned, uh, who is um, a geographer, is he a geographer? He's, an anth he's a sociologist um, on Italian mobilities and circulating diasporas. Um, then Rhiannon Welch, who is, uh, teaches Italian studies at Rutgers, who is here with us. Um, uh, another essay mentioned by Simona, Contact, Contagion, Immunization, Gianni Amelio's L'America. And then Stephanie, who is a scholar of Italian studies, but also cultural anthropology, Becoming Ospite, Hospitality and Mobility at the Center of Temporary <coughs> Permanence. It's an unbelievable um, you know, welcome to the paradoxical world of mobilities, right? The center of temporary permanence. And Guido Tintori, who's a scholar of migration, um, uh, Italian mobilities and the demos, and he talks about citizenship. He's an expert on uh, Italian Americans also, um, very, very fine scholar. Then Francesca Locatelli, uh, an Italian scholar who, um, what is her field? I think she is, she's a historian who's done really groundbreaking work on migration to the colonies and also urban history. She's one of the few people who studied the urban history of colonialism and the flows of, of Italians back and forth, who gets expelled from the colonies, um, things that a lot of people don't focus on. Um, and then Imagining Lampedusa, um, uh, how did you pronounce her first name? Right. Anya O'Healy, who's a scholar of cinema and, it, and, and also does Italian things uh, about representation through film. And then David Forgash, who teaches in our department, um, Coasts, Blockades, and the Free Movement of People. Uh, so you, you, you see the range of um, disciplinary um, backgrounds that we, we chose to include to have a sense of, you know, even getting a little bit of a handle on this subject, so. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. I read uh, this book and I can say it is a good book. So what's the difference between a good book and a bad book? A good book is easy to read and hard to write. And a bad book is the opposite. It's hard to read and it's very easy to write. This is the difference. And there is no, actually, there is a novelist, <coughs> there is no difference between uh, fiction and non fiction. So a good book is based in my opinion, in two things. The first thing, find a good idea. Because there are a lot of ideas. You have, you have to choose one interesting idea. <coughs> it's like, I'm, I, I'm going to use a metaphor of a trip. Stephanie is an expert in tourism and especially in Italy, it's a really beautiful country. It's like trip. So the authors uh, make choice of destination. They say, our destination is this. This is the first, uh, I mean, the first decision. The second decision is uh, what's, the, what's the strategy to reach this destination? 
because you can find, you can have a wonderful idea, but you don't have the instruments, you don't have a, a strategy to reach this, this, uh, this destination. So in this book, there is a, a good destination and there are very good strategies to reach this destination. So mobility is very important concept. So personally is central in my life. Uh, so I was born in Algeria in a very Berber family. My mother doesn't speak Arabic. So at home we spoke Berber. I have five sisters and three brothers. So at home we spoke Berber. Uh, um, outside we spoke Algerian Arabic. And then at school we, uh, I spoke, I spoke uh, classical Arabic. And then I learned French. And with me, my cousins I used to speak French. And then in 1995, I moved to Italy. So there is a mobility in language. And now, last year, I moved to uh, New York. Mobility of languages. But there is a very funny mobility, funny, interesting mobility. So um, my birth was the first mobility. And it was very problematic. Because instead of coming with my feet as my sisters and brothers, I decided to uh, come out with my head. And my mother risked a lot. Uh, it's, it's, so for me, it's really a, a big trauma. Uh, then I moved to Italy, and it was very hard birth because I was a refugee in Italy. I lived nine years as a refugee. It's a very, very important experience for me. Then I became Im immigrant with Permesso di Soggiorno. And in 2008, I became Italian citizen. So a big mobility. Last year, I, I moved uh, to the United States, and I, I, I started with the same process to, to have green card. Uh, so a lot of mobilities. So mobility for me as a concept, as idea, is very, very interesting. Um, I love soccer, of course. And you know the difference, and I use the metaphor of soccer in, in many my novels, especially class of civilizations, because I had this intuition that in Italy, you know, in Italy, the, the uh, I mean, Italians are very famous for uh, a model of, 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 uh, of, of game called Catinaccio. So Catinaccio, unfortunately, Catinaccio was invented by an Austrian uh, coach called uh, Kaplan. <laughs> and in the beginning, the name of Catinaccio, the luck in English, the luck, in, 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 so the, the beginning of the, the name was French, le, le verrou. So, but Italians, especially in the 50s and the 60s, they, you know, they, they developed this, this, uh, this model and unfortunately very uh, bad model of playing uh, based on defense, no mobility. Fortunately, in the 70s, the Dutch invented the total soccer. Of, uh, uh, so the difference between Catinaccio, luck, and uh, uh, the total, total soccer is mobility. It's mobility. It's about the space in the field, occupying the space, playing without ball, giocare senza palla. I can speak, I can talk about soccer for, uh, for hours. So, um, so I'm going to apply this model <coughs> of a good book, I mean, destination and uh, the, the strategy to reach this destination. So uh, we decided, actually, um, Simona suggested to divide the, the job. So I'm, I'm going to focus on 
the, the four chapters. I mean, chapter five, six, seventh, and eight. I'm going to, to find the destination. There are, sometimes there are more than one destination, but for me, it's, I, I chose this. And then I'm going to show you why I, <clears throat> I, uh, I think that it's, uh, it's easy to reach this de destination. So chapter, so yeah, just uh, the, I, uh, I can't uh, no, not mention my father. Uh, my father passed away uh, six years ago and uh, he was immigrant in France for many years. Uh, my father used to, to say, this is very, very nice uh, 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 sentence, it's about mobility. Uh, trees, trees have roots to stay in the same place. Men have feet to move, to discover the world. It's, it's, I think it's, it's wonderful. So chapter, chapter five. What's the, the, who is the author? Uh, yeah. Tintori. Yeah, Italian Mobilities and Demo, Demos, Guido Tintori. So this is a very, very interesting uh, idea. It's about the population of Italy, the population of nation, the popolo italiano. Interesting, interesting because just ye yesterday, yesterday, I saw this, the site of my publisher, Italian publisher. EO, and to the same uh, Europa editions, and they, they changed this, this, the, the website. I found that they choose the, the criteria of geography to present the authors. So I found myself in Algeria. So there are many countries, and in Algeria, Amar Lakus in Algeria. So the problem that I wrote these novels in Italian, it's about Italy. So this is very interesting. So for my publisher, I am I'm Algerian, not, uh, not Italian. Just an observation. <clears throat> um, so what are the categories for this, the, the Il Popolo Italiano? So we have uh, I used to say I'm Italian, but I'm not very Italian. Sono italiano, ma non italianissimo. It's, it's obvious because I, my name is Amara. Amara is not Italian name. My parents are not Italian, etc., etc. So I'm Italian, but not Italian 100%. So for this uh, Italian nation, also the, the population of Italy, so we have categories. So the first category, italianissimi. Italian, 100%. Then we have Italians, like me. Then we have immigrants, we immigrants with uh, uh, a permit residency for one year. Then we have immigrants for two years. Then we have immigrants with permanent residency, like a green card. Then we have refugees. Then, so we have political refugees. Then we have humanitarian refugees. And we have the last category. Actually, I worked for many years with the refugees. One day, uh, uh, an Iraqi uh, refugee uh, uh, told, told me that he, he, is, he was living in the park uh, because he, he didn't uh, uh, get the humanitarian uh, uh, refugee and actually humanitarian refugee doesn't exist. So we have Geneva, uh, we have Geneva uh, Convention. It's about political refugees. So in order to respect the Constitution and the, the Geneva Convention, etc., to give political refugee for these people, we decided to give them humanitarian uh, refugee. So he told me that he 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 didn't have. Uh, the humanitarian refugee, so, but he, they gave him animal refugees. So in Arabic, so he was Iraq, Iraqi. In, in Arabic, we have Luju Siyasi, 
Lujo Insani. So this, this uh, guy invented the third category, Lujo Hayawani. Hayawan is animal, because he was living with many uh, other re refugee uh, uh, seeker, seekers of uh, asylum in the park. So this is interesting about this, uh, this category. Um, chapter, chapter six. Simona, what's the title, chapter six? Migrate, migrating to the colonies and building the myth of Italia, Italiani brava gente, the rise, dem demise, and legacy of Italian settler colonialism. This is interesting. It's, yes, this is very, very interesting. It's mobility from the, the present to the past. Leonardo Sciascia said, ours is a, count, is a country without memory and truth. Ours is a country without memory and truth. And actually it's true not just for Italy, but for Algeria, Mediterranean, and etc. So the problem with memory. And there are, in this chapter, there are a lot of examples uh, it's a lot of connections between the past, especially colonialism, Italian colonialism, and the, uh, and the present. Actually, uh, my friend, Ijaba Shego, is working a lot about this topic, connecting the past with the present. And she published a wonderful book last year about, uh, Ro uh, about Rome, Roma Nigata, Denied Rome. It's about the, 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 the fascist uh, monuments in Rome. She, 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 she did a wonderful book, wonderful book, and she published recently a novel, Adwa. She is working a lot, because I think it's very important to understand the present uh, by, by uh, reflecting about the past. So the problem about the mobility from the present to the past, it's the same problem with Algeria. It's the same problem. We have, you have, if you want to, uh, to explore your memory, you need instruments, you need knowledge, knowledge. And you need some values like courage to face the, the, the reality. And in this, this chapter, there are a lot of examples uh, um, uh, of politicians, uh, Trimonti and Mantica, uh, in different uh, uh, declarations, the, the, uh, so they said that Italy, actually, the I Italian colonialism was very, very, yeah, very light. Not, it's, it's not true. Colonialism is colonialism. Um, so the problem here, the problem, maybe the question is the confusion between memory and imaginary. When people have difficulty to deal with the memory, so they use imaginary. And this is an invasion, an invention. So there is no facts. This is just an invasion and projection to the, to, to the, to the, the reality. And actually, I worked, I worked uh, a lot about Italian memory of immigration. And uh, uh, on November uh, 23rd, I'm going to uh, give a talk. I'm, here, it's about Turin, because I, I, I lived in Turin two years. I moved from mobility. I moved, I moved from to Rome to Turin, and I lived two years there, and I wrote two novels about uh, 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 the memory of the southerners, uh, Meridionale, because I think it's very important to explore this immigration. And in Italy, especially in the literature, is a taboo. Maybe in cinema, we have uh, Rocco and uh, his brother, Sorki Sui Fratelli, and Cosiere uh, Deva, no? uh, the, uh, the Amelio. <clears throat> but in literature, we don't have really examples. Uh, chapter seven, it, yes. Imaging Lampedusa. This is interesting. This is interesting because the, the idea is about uh, representation, of course, through cinema, through images. And images are, images are more effective today. It's really more effective. And this is the, 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 the theme of my, topic, my, my talk uh, next week at Cornell University. I'm going to give talk about this, how images are more effective 
to narrate immigration. Uh, so the problem here is about the narrators. How, what, what's the, what, who is the, 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 the good, who is the good uh, narrator? It's about immigration, Lampedusa, for example. In this chapter, they have, we have two uh, good examples, good narrators. The first is Dagmawi, is my friend. Dagmawi is in, in uh, I don't know, he now is uh, still a refugee, but he was a refugee. Uh, so he, uh, he did a wonderful job uh, by doing uh, two documentaries. Of course, he is, as a narrator, he is really lovable because he lived the experience and when he, when he tells something, of course, when he, he tells something, uh, he, has, he has something interesting to, to tell. This is the first example. Uh, the second example is Krialesi. Krialesi <coughs> did a very, very good film, movie, uh, ter uh, Terra Ferma. So Terra Ferma is the result of his previous movie, Novo Mondo. Uh, the, the, in English, what's the title in English? Doors, Golden Doors. Golden Door, yeah. So you can't understand terra firma without memory. And this is a big advantage for Kialesi. So he did his job with, with, with memory, and he was ready to, to narrate the present. But you have to start with memory. It's, this is very interesting in Kialesi. The sh last chapter. The last chapter is Coasts, Blockades, and the Free Movement of People. David Forgesh. So I am a fan of David Forgesh because I, I loved his book, Italy's uh, Margins. It's an incredible book, and I, I had the opportunity to, to use it with my students. Uh, and again, here again, the idea is wonderful, Margins, and he did a wonderful job. It's very really easy to read, hard to write. And the evidence that La Terza, one of the most important Italian publishers for nonfiction, a um, few months ago, published the translation from English to Italian. So the quality of the book, it's a very incredible quality. In, the, the, in this chapter, the idea, the destiny, the good destiny, it's about borders. Uh, I can I can I can talk uh, for a long time about borders, <laughs> but I have just one one very short story. Uh, many years ago, I was in Sicily, um, uh, in very small uh, town uh, called uh, uh, Grotte. It's very close to Racalmuto, uh, Shasha's uh, town. The mayor, the mayor. Uh, um, wanted to show me his town, so he, wa he we were in his car, and he he was um, explaining about his town and uh, etc. At a certain moment, he he stopped, and in the in the street, he stopped and he t he, 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 he 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 told me, he said to me, look, in the right, to the same street, in the right. This is my town. In the in the in the in the left. So in the right is my town. In the left is a town, a neighbor town. It's to the same street. I mean, to this is the, the idea about you know the vulnerability of, of borders. And in this chapter, it's about vulnerabilities, the vulnerability of borders in Italy, it's because we have. Uh, how I I, I wrote the. How many kilometers? Uh, I, 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 yes, seven thousand kilometers of the. It's this is impossible to control. So it's impossible to militarize eight uh, eight thousand uh, borders. So the, the conclusion. Is, uh, I maybe I talked a lot. So the conclusion is about um, uh, the editing of the book. 
so in this book, there are eight players. So if you want to have a good team, if you, if you want to win, you have to, go, to have you know, good coaches, you know, strategies and uh, models of playing, etc. So uh, certainly Ruth and uh, Stephanie did an incredible job uh, of editing in terms of putting you know, the, the, the pieces together. And it's not easy. It's not easy when you, you, you deal with eight, with nine styles, uh, etc. So uh, thank you so much for this book and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simona Navarra. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming this evening. Um, it was really a pleasure to edit this book with Ruth and to have all of our contributors on being able to read their essays. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about the genesis of this project. And it really began, I think it was three or four years ago when um, Ruth came to the University of Oklahoma to do a course on Italian film histories. And we got to talking about cinematic mobilities. And I think to bring out one of the points that you both made about the how film has the power to make the invisible visible in a very, um, uh, abridged and immediate kind of way, um, which is one of the reasons why we have essays about cinema in this volume. And the book really departs from the sentiment that cultural cl critic Zygmunt Bauman expressed a few years ago, that mobility has fast become the main stratifying factor of our time, and that there are profound differences between those who move by choice and those who are moved by force. And um, there in the social sciences has been something called the mobilities turn, primarily out of sociology, primarily in the UK. And a lot of the people who were previously doing work on tourism have gone to, expanded their frame to, to think about mobility in general. And when we talk about mobility um, in this mobilities paradigm that's being led by a sociologist named John Urry in the UK, we're talking, yes, about the physical movement of people, but we're also talking about the movement of things. We're also talking about the movement of, of, of ideas, and we talk about imaginaries, right? imaginary mobilities, as well as communicative and virtual mobilities, so the cinema being one of the most powerful. Um, and in particular, I became very interested in what John Uri calls mobility-generated inequality. Right? What is this difference between people who are moved, who can move by choice and people who are, who are moved by force. And it really crystallized for me in my experience, this is now years ago, five years ago, getting my permesso di soggiorno in Rome. And because of the passport that I held and the way that I looked, I was allowed to jump the queue in the questura. And I thought, you know, this is, this isn't right. You know, legally I hold the same status of extracomunitario as everybody else standing in line. And that really got me thinking about this inequality, in, and in particular, the relationship between state power, state-sanctioned mobility, you know, and those, um, and, and who is allowed to move and who isn't. And this brought me to do this work at Ponte Galeria, um, which again, as Simona mentioned, is this centro di identificazione e espulsione on the outskirts of Rome. And if you've ever taken the train in from Fiumicino into the center of town, you pass right by it, but nobody knows about it. It's just there, kind of hidden in the wasteland outside Rome. So that was really the beginning of Ruth, our conversation about mobility and what does it mean and how it, and where can we locate Italy within this broader discourse, within this new mobility's turn in the social sciences. And uh, in our conversations, we got to talking about history and how do we, one of the critiques of mobility studies today is it's too contemporary. Nobody thinks about the past. It's all about you know, the ways that we move today or the way that objects move, the way that ideas move. But how can we historicize and particularize this phenomenon? And what is it about Italy in particular that has long been this crossroads for the Mediterranean? It's long been a destination of pilgrimage, of tourism. And what we tried to draw out in the volume were um, three trans-historical phenomena 
emigration, colonialism, and immigration, which we see as being linked, both historically, uh, phenomenologically, and culturally linked. So some of the policies related to immigration today have their roots in Italy's colonial project. Um, and these are the, some of the, the articulations we wanted to draw for them. And we do hope this book opens a conversation uh, about Italian mobilities that can be developed further. Some of the things we also didn't include in this are virtual mobilities, right? the digital divide. Who has access to cell phones? Who has access to the internet? Um, and how that could also inf affect our different social stratifications and inequalities that are perpetuated. So, and I also wanted to note, um, and I was thinking about this recently because I realized that Ponte Galeria has a Facebook page. And people who have been there have been saying, oh, I've been here. And that's a new way to memorialize this experience of being uh, what Michel Agier calls an undesirable. And this could be refugee, asylum seeker, migrant. I think his, his word for it, undesirable, is probably the best term. Um, so, um, and one of the things that uh, if you if you get the book or you read it, um, we we felt we had to um, justify uh, in the introduction was why we didn't have an essay on tourism because we we were very careful in our choices um, of of topics and and who we wanted uh, to write about those topics, but. Um, it was a, it was a political choice, and and we started this volume when before the migration crisis um, really uh, ex exploded, and it's it's sad that um, during the copy edits and the production of the book, um, David Forgash and others were wanting to update the numbers and the latest you know, tragedies because um, they were continually being out of date. So we, although Italy is, is obviously well known as a tourist country, we, we decided to privilege this, this other dimension. Um, we also uh, debated and decided not to include a chapter on um, migrant literature. We preferred to have, because we had to, kind of think about sub-themes, and the main ones are the ones uh, Stephanie mentioned, but we decided to privilege the visual because, and, and this also was a little prescient, because uh, the way that the migration crisis is experienced is, I'm sure that in the future, um, there's a lot of wonderful reportage, but, and there will be more literary reflections about this crisis, but the way we've been experiencing it is, so much through photography, um, and and how does that echo in certain um, documentary and um, feature films? So we that that was part of the decision making process that we um, had, and it, and it was also great fun. Um, you know, in, in in history and Italian studies, we don't have as much as social sciences or or hard sciences the tradition of co-authoring things. We're very uh, you know, we're very solitary and everything is single authored. And when you co-edit a book, you do the introduction together. And so it was, it was great fun to, to work on this. Um, but I, I, um, I'd like to kind of make a personal reflection that has to do with the, the Italy part also that, so, you know, my life has been quite determined by mobility of two parents uh, growing up in the States, but two parents who are immigrants from very, very different places and growing up with no one uh, around us, um, everybody way far away and, different, and in different countries, in many different countries. And on my father's side, I am the first person to be born in the same country as her parent for 200 years. Every single generation has moved countries. Um, and, um, and so my... My, actually, I'm not, sorry, it's my daughter who's the first, but I'm not born in the same country. It's my daughter who is the first person to be born in the same country. So, um, one of the attractions, sometimes people say, well, you know, why do you study Italy? You know, you like the food and you, you know, you went there and, and, you know, I did go to Rome and I was uncertain if I was going to do Italian or German. I saw Rome and I thought, that's it. 
Um, however, um, one of the attractions of Italy for me, coming from this background, um, was that it, it, it's a sense of rootedness and fixity, and that um, people lived, I was in my 20s when I started going there, and you meet people, and they lived, if, if they didn't live at home, um, they lived right near or in the same apartment building um, with their family. Um, and there's just a sense of, again, roots. Um, and it could be regional roots or it could be just family roots. And this, this was very appealing to me. And then the other thing was this kind of very comforting um, built environment, the, the architectural patrimony. And I remember um, one of my, you know, been coming and going for decades to Italy. And in 1993, I was back in Los Angeles, where I'm from. And unfortunately, I lived through the um, Northridge earthquake, which was really, really horrible. And um, so the building was collapsing, and I ended up spending the night, this is one of these like bizarre things, with Carlo Ginzburg, the famous historian, and his wife in a little cinquecento um, with her mother. With his, so Carlo Ginzburg, his wife, and his mother-in-law in this tiny car because we didn't know what else to do, because we were all in the same uh, apartment building with, at the Getty. We, I had a Getty visiting fellowship. So anyway, so then I, I went through this, and it was really quite traumatizing. I'd been through other earthquakes, but this was the worst. So then uh, two weeks later, I was scheduled to go back to Rome. And I wandered for the first day, and I remember going to the Quirinale and going to the ghetto in the kind of ancient area and putting my hands on the, on the walls and feeling very comforted by this solidity, like these things were still here because I'd just been through this like cheap post-war LA construction that was like crumbling, right? So, so all of this, right? And then, so it's an irony that, you know, as my studies, where they've taken me, you know, is to the part of Italy that has, Italy's a country that's been more affected by movement than almost any other. And I, I keep coming back to this uh, fact of emigration, this kind of, by now I really consider it like a kind of a trauma for, it, it has a good and a bad side. It's hugely influenced the, the history, the fact that, you know, a chunk of the population left. What does it mean to leave, to defect? And, and there was reverse migration and coming and going. So now I, and in, you know, earlier decades, this history of emigration and movement was kept apart from national history in the sense that it was labor history. It was migration history. And of course, colonialism wasn't really integrated either. So we're at this, since really only 2000 or so, like the last 15 years, we're getting to this new paradigm, and that's part of also the integration of Italian-American studies. And I'm very proud in our department, we're one of the few or maybe the only departments that has Italian studies. We have a visiting you know, pr professorship, an endowed professorship for somebody to come and do Italian-American studies in Italian studies department, right? So um, I think that part of the attraction to do a book uh, like this with Stephanie was to look at where, where are, what's the thinking about these questions today? And, and of course, Italy's um, geography as Italy's destiny, right? For it, it's, not, it's destiny less <coughs> in the period of historic immigration, but now with immigration. Um, and so much of the discourse about Italianness and um, is, is decided by positionality. That, you know, feeling they're the, the boot of Europe and not the heart of Europe, and now the kind of sense of vulnerability. So um, when we thought about what to include, which was not easy, it's a selection and choice, we were kind of looking for the most interesting work, um, the newest kind of work that was being done by interesting scholars, but also I think it was our effort to to understand neither of us is Italian or Italian-American. Our, our part of our process of understanding what Italy is today through its past. Um, and that's why a, a, a number of the, a chunk of the book is about kind of things that are leading to contemporary Italy or contemporary Italy. 
Um, and there are other things we could have included. We, we could have included something about the contemporary um, intellectual emigration from Italy, the brain drain, right? But there's, you know, we had a we had to stop somewhere. Um, so so that's that's all I will say. And I guess we could open it up to questions. Um, and I wanted to recognize the Consul General of New York, uh, Minister Natalia Quintavale, who is here with us, and we're really grateful um, for the support you give to uh, our department and the Casa Italiana and uh, the interest in this, this subject, which has so defined Italy. So thank you. So any questions for any of the panelists or comments? Yes. Um, oh God, uh, has to do with um, the issue of um, memory and imaginary. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a distinction, but if you look at something like the creation of false memories mm -hmm. um, and how permanent they are um, and how real they are, um, I'm just, I'm very curious about maybe discussing where that line is in between the two and the value of that distinction. Well, um, I guess I could talk a bit about the language that's used in these facilities. And you're absolutely right that there is a discourse of dehumanization. And this is well documented in literature about concentration camps. You think of Primo Levi, right? And he talks about being an animal, being at the animal level, how when you were eating, they, the, the Austrian or German soldiers would describe it as fressen, which is the verb that's used when animals eat, not essen, when people eat. Um, and when I was doing uh, these field visits to Ponte Galeria, people I talked to um, were very, very cognizant of this dehumanization, you know, and would say things like, they treat us like animals. Um, and it's a very complicated system. And it's not just the people there, but also the people working in these facilities. I mean, what surprised me was that I found a great deal of empathy amongst um, the people working in the Questura, the people working in, uh, at the time, the way that Ponte Galeria is set up, um, the legal process is handled by the Questura, which is, uh, and also um, uh, the Ministry of the Interior, but it's the day-to-day -day operations are subcontracted out. At the time, it was to, uh, for a long time, it was to the Red Cross, and at the time when I was in there, it was to, a, a, a not basically a nonprofit, a social cooperative called Auxilium. And, you know, um, there was a great deal amount of empathy, particularly amongst the social workers who were there. Um, but the language, what I write about in the essay, is the idea of being an ospite. And, and it comes from, you know, the Latin hostis, right? Which can be both host and enemy. So hospitality, we have the roots of hospitality, but we also have the roots of hostility. And this sort of dual-edged nature, I think, comes to be spatialized. It comes to be spatialized in the paradox that is temporary permanence. And what I tried to do in the essay was think about, okay, it can be very depressing writing about these kind of paradoxical things. How can we find any hope within this paradox. And this is where I, I draw on the work of Rosi Braidotti and her work, her very Deleuzian work on becoming a uh, nomad, becoming minoritarian, and finding, is there anything that we can recuperate out of this? And I gesture toward it in the end of the essay of these moments of hope when people are released from Ponte Galeria, because most of the time, you know, people aren't deported, um, they're simply, like sent off with papers that are usually then burned. Um, and there's a moment of hope in that release. I also see it too, um, and his name is escaping me, 
um, in, in art and in music. There's a really interesting um, Egyptian rapper, I forget his name right now, but he, Amir, Amir who, who raps about Ponte Galeria <coughs> itself. So from his experience in the center um, of being in Hospite, he comes out and he has this amazing rap song. So I find that hope in art and music and literature, and this is where we can, we can look. So memory and imaginary. I also think um, it's a good question. Um, we can approach it through the experience of the emigrant and think about, you know, there's a, there's a mechanism that goes on and it's replicated all over the world. Think about the little Italys, how they were, not so much anymore, they were kind of, um, you, you would go to them and they're old fashioned often because they are replicating the vision of Italy that the emigrant had at the time, more or less, that he or she left. So they become a little bit fossilized and they're a kind of Id idealized vision of Italy, right? With some influences from where they are today. And that's a very interesting kind of disjuncture, right? So you're in the, na the now is also the, the before, right? Um, I remember growing up we, in Los Angeles, we had to go, there was this pub, because this was the, Brit the British half, the Scottish, but the, lived in London, so there was a British pub that was like, just like f stuck in stone of a certain vision of a pub with the darts and the ch fish and chips that you had to have in the paper and, and the newspaper, and it was all, um, you know, of a certain era. And this is where my mother wanted to go because she missed, you know, this was her idea for a while of what it was. And that's typical with little Italy's all over the world. So. There is this, it's poignant, and you see this with films about immigration. Um, Laura Marx, who is a film theorist, who doesn't work on Italy, but she's done a very interesting book about how films about immigration are very sensual films because they're evoking, they're trying to evoke through film the taste, the smells, the, the sensory aspect of of what you miss about your everyday experience and what you feel you've lost, right, from your, from your homeland. So I think that this is something that can be explored for the Italian case given the prominence of emigration. Um, at different times, you have historic immigration, you have, you know, the post-war, you have contemporary. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot that would be fruitful to look at. really been able to see how the language of migration has changed, as you said, you know, to this negative connotation of invasion um, and attacks, uh, you know, on the country as a whole, especially with nationalist parties like Lega Nor, I mean, Matteo Savini, that's a whole other conversation, but I guess my question is, how do we kind of change that language, and how do we make this invisible topic visible with not necessarily just through imagery. So with movies like um, Terra Ferma or Duck Mao, who actually came you know, visited the site a few semesters ago, how do we make it a visible topic and one that people care about without necessarily needing to make it up in you know, this Hollywood movie? Sure, um, that's a very good question. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> and um, immediately I just thought of again, the power of film, and uh, one of the films that Anya O'Healy writes about in her chapter on Imagining Lampedusa is actually a film called Scomparse, and, you know, uh, it is the making of Terra Ferma, in which she interviews the extras, and if you've seen Terra Ferma, you know, there's that scene where the, the people are trying to clamor into the boat, and it's very traumatic, and having people uh, from East Africa who have now have their permissi di sojourn or legally res resident there being extras on this film and having to relive the trauma of a crossing from North Africa to Lampedusa um, was very powerful. And Anya, I think, writes very astutely about this, the reliving of trauma and what that means and the reappropriation of that experience in the name of film, 
and what that might mean. Um, I think also a point that David Forgatch makes in his book is the how quickly the attitude toward immigration in Italy changed. And he writes about, in particular, um, the first waves after the fall of the Berlin Wall in the early 90s, the waves of Albanian immigrants coming to Italy and you know those famous images of the ships in body and you know, later Toscano's ad campaign for Benetton. Um, but if you remember, and, uh, and I've, I remember this is 91, 92, um, there was a great uh, acceptance, right? There was this, the, the activation of a memory of Italian emigration, you know, that we have to be kind, we need to take these people in because our grandfathers were once shown this kindness in America, in Australia. And I think, if I'm remembering correctly, I think Andreotti even said that he had, had adopted two, three Albanian teenagers and every Italian should do the same. But, um, did he? <laughs> okay, so history is repeating itself. But what, what David describes in his essay is how quickly the sentiment turned and that there, the hardline response became universal across the Italian political spectrum. And the question becomes, how do we change that back? I would like to um, say something regarding this because I think that it is really <coughs> important to understand the construction mm -hmm. and the malafede in many cases of not only the Italian political spheres mm -hmm. but also of uh, um, directors. Uh, I, and I do not want to attack Amelio, but uh, uh, I have been in conversation with a good friend of mine, Ron Kubati, who is Albanian. And he has given me uh, a great opportunity to, uh, to understand the case of Albania and how, for example, his reaction, his negative reaction, Kadare's negative reaction to uh, uh, Amelio's, uh, um, Amelio's uh, uh, representation. Uh, because it is thanks to these representations that it was so easy for the Italian population to go from the discourse of uh, uh, accepting uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the representation of the Albanians as uh, um, thieves, uh, uh, as, as gang members, and so on. What, uh, what Amelio foreclosed in that particular representation of Albania is Italy's continuous invasion of Albania. Since the beginning of the 20th century, Italy has been heavily invested in the domination of Albania. And when uh, Amelio shows in the first uh, scenes of the movie the uh, proclamation of the uh, annexation of uh, Albania by, uh, by, the fascist, uh, um, by the fascist regime, he doesn't then continue to reflect on that and to realize that it was actually the fact that uh, the anti-fascist forces that fought against fascism were the communists. And communism enter, uh, entered Albania because they had to fight fascism. But before there was a monarchy. So the intrusion of, uh, of Italy into the political sphere of Albania has changed that country dramatically and produced a lot of uh, uh, damage. Today still, we, we are not facing the colonial repercussions, okay? The repercussions in the present. And that's why I think that um, Italian mobility is, is a very important point of departure for us, and it is, um, it is really um, interesting that it started from two American uh, um, uh, authors, two American scholars. We need to delve more in depth, because if we don't delve into the history, then we will leave more space to the imaginary. And the imaginary is a fiction, uh, which tends to give a comforting uh, scenario. Uh, we mettiamoci il cuore in pace, 
No? These poor Albanians. Okay, oh, look at that, you know. And ultimately, adding insult to injury was the name of the ship, Partizani. Because it was really a reflection. Look what you Partizani, you know, are now. Mm -hmm. huh? Look at, uh, you know, at this nation of poor, dejected uh, uh, zombies. So really, it is important that beyond the representation, which is a, a cultural construct, we look at the history. And the history will explain to us many, many uh, forzature, mm -hmm. no? many, uh, um, many concealed uh, stories. So that's, it's very important that we study, that we continue to study this. And, uh, maybe you want to add? I would like, j just, uh, I would like to add <coughs> a consideration about uh, dealing with memory. You know, memory has wounds. It's not easy to touch memory. So, the, uh, so we have to pay uh, uh, a price for this. It's not easy. I remember uh, a wonderful uh, phrase of uh, uh, Pedrak Matievich. He's a Serbian intellectual. Um, I don't know, he, uh, so he lived in Italy, I met him in, uh, in Rome. So once he said, ci chiedono di voltare pagina. He was talking about uh, ex Yugoslavia. Ci chiedono di voltare pagina. Va bene, d'accordo. Siamo d'accordo di voltare pagina, ma vogliamo solo leggerla, questa pagina. So they asked uh, ask us to change chapter. So it's okay, I agree. We need just, we want just to read it. This is the problem with memory, and uh, so. Uh, one last question. Thank you. you mentioned um, a reference to Turin and um, the Meridionale, and that's, I guess, another focus on migration within Italy itself. And I was curious, because you didn't finish that thought, what, what you were referring to. Was it the north versus the south? Um, so if you could elaborate. This is the topic of my, <laughs> my, my talk. And to, to say it's, it's so long, really. So I, I invite you to, to come. and Because uh, I'm going to really, I'm going to, to talk about two novels and uh, my experience moving from Rome to Turin in order to write th these novels. So I went to live in San Salvario, it's a very important neighborhood in Turin, where in the 60s, many Southerners uh, lived there. So I have a lot of things to, to, to say, so this is 